pages 197 to 215 of Refugee, chapters 34, 35, and 36. Joseph, just outside Havana Harbor, 1939, 19 days from home. Joseph wished he was invisible. Once the rest of the passengers discovered who had jumped overboard yesterday, everyone stopped to tell him how sorry they were, how everything would be all right. But how could it be all right? How could it ever be all right? Joseph stood at the rail on a deck where his father had jumped down. Down below, the sea was no longer empty. It was dotted with little motorboats and rowboats. Some carried reporters shouting up questions and trying to get pictures of of the ship. Other boats offered up bunches of fresh bananas and bags of coconuts and out oranges. Passengers on sea deck tossed money down and the fruit was passed up the ladder by the Cuban policemen guarding the top and the bottom. Lately, though, the boats were full of relatives of people on board, mostly men. They had come ahead to Cuba to get jobs and find places for their families to live. One man brought the same little white dog every day and held it up for his wife to wave to. The boats with relatives came close enough for their families to yell back and forth a little, but they couldn't get any closer. Thanks to Joseph's father, a handful of Cuban police boats now surrounded the St. Louis. They kept the rescue ships at a distance and watched for anyone else who tried to jump to freedom or death. At night, the Cuban police boats swept the hall with searchlights, and the St. Louis's crew members, on the captain's orders, patrolled the decks on suicide watch. Evelyn, there he is! There's Papa! Renata cried. She stood a few paces away from Joseph down the rail, trying to point out one of the little rowboats to her sister. Where? I don't see him, Evelyn whined. Joseph was more interested in the small police boat that had navigated its way through the flotilla and was pulling up to the St. Louis. Anytime they had a visitor now, it was cause for conversation, and soon word spread throughout the ship that the boat had brought the Cuban policeman who had saved Joseph's father. Joseph ran down to fetch his mother and sister, and together they hurried to the social hall, where a group of passengers and crew gathered to give the Cuban policeman a hero's welcome. They parted for the policeman, cheering and slapping him on the back and shaking hands with him as he went. It was the first time he had been back to the ship since jumping overboard to save Joseph's father, and Joseph and his family strained to get a good look at him over the heads of the other passengers. Joseph's mother cried and put her hand to her mouth, and Joseph felt a surge of affection for the policeman. This was the man who had saved his father's life. The policeman seemed genuinely flattered and surprised by all the attention. He was a short, stocky man with olive skin, a wide face, and a thick mustache. He wore blue pants, a gray shirt with epaulets on the shoulders, and matching gray beret. Around his waist was a leather belt with a nightstick and a holster hanging from it. His name, they were told, was Mariano Padron. Captain Schroeder arrived to thank Officer Padron on behalf of the passengers and crew. Joseph felt a ripple of tension spread throughout the room. Joseph had seen the captain less and less as the hot days of waiting at anchor dragged on, and he wasn't the only passenger who had noticed. But they were there to celebrate Officer Padron, not badger the captain about why they were still on the ship. The mood became happy again when the policeman was presented with a gift of 150 resmarks that had been collected from grateful passengers. Officer Padron was stunned, and so was Joseph. 150 resmarks was a lot of money, especially for people who might need that money later to pay for visas and entrance fees. Officer Padron tried to refuse the money, but the passengers wouldn't hear of it. I was just doing my job, Officer Padron told the audience through a translator. But I will never forget this. I will never forget any of you. Thank you. The passengers applauded again, and while many of them turned their attention to the captain to ask him for the status report, Joseph and his mother and sister pushed forward to talk to the policeman. Officer Padron's eyes lit up at the sight of Joseph's mother. He said something in Spanish, and the passenger who had spoken for him in front of the crowd smiled and translated his words. Senora! Your father was a thief? Joseph's mother frowned. A thief? My father? No, I don't understand. Your father. He must be a thief, Officer Padron said through the translator, because he stole the stars from the sky and put them in the senora's eyes. 
Joseph finally understood. It was some kind of compliment about how pretty she was. His mother smiled politely but impatiently. Officer Pajon, what about my husband? She asked, is he all right? They won't let me go ashore and see him. The policeman took off his hat. I am so sorry. So very sorry. Senora Landau, yes. Your husband is alive, he said through the interpreter. He is in the hospital. He has been... Officer Padron said something more, but the translator frowned. It was beyond his limited Spanish. Officer Padron could see his confusion, and he pantomimed what he meant by turning his wrists upside down, closing his eyes, and lolling his head back as, like he was asleep. Sedated, Mom said. There was a pain in her voice. Joseph knew she blamed herself. The whole reason her husband was gone was because she had been sedated and unable to stop him. Officer Padron nodded. It's not good, he said through the interpreter, but he will live. Joseph's mother took both of the policemen's hands in her own and kissed them. Thank you, Officer Padron. She spoke in German, but the policeman seemed to understand. He blushed and nodded. Then he spied Ruthie half hidden behind her mother's skirt and knelt down to her. He put his policeman's beret on her head and said something in Spanish, and she smiled. He says, you're the policewoman now, the translator said. He will be the criminal. You must catch him. Officer Padron led Ruthie on a merry chase around the room, Ruthie squealing. Joseph's mother laughed through a sob. It was the first time Joseph had heard her laugh or seen her smile in months. Officer Padron let Ruthie catch him, and he plucked the hat off Ruthie's head and put it on Joseph's head, speaking in Spanish. He says, it's your turn, the translator said. Oh, no, Joseph said. He waved a hand to make sure the policeman understood. He wasn't in the mood for fun and games, and besides, he was too old for that kind of thing. Officer Padron tapped Joseph's chest with the back of his hand, urging him to play. He says he is the passenger, the translator said. Officer Padron raised himself up in mock anger and spoke in Spanish. You, senor policeman, the translator said. When will we leave the ship? The happy mood suddenly disappeared. Joseph and his family and the translator all looked at each other awkwardly. Officer Padron had only meant to mimic what everyone asked him all the time, but the question made Joseph sag. It felt like they were never getting off the ship. Officer Padron realized his mistake immediately and looked anguished at having brought it up. He nodded in sympathy, then in unison, he and Joseph spoke the answer all the Cuban guards always gave. Manana. Isabel, somewhere between the Bahamas and Florida, the year 1994, five days from home. Isabel slipped over the side of the boat into the sea and sighed. The water was warm, but it felt much cooler than being in the boat. The sun was just setting on the western horizon, turning the world into a sepia-toned pho photograph. But it still had to be close to 100 degrees outside. If it wouldn't have swamped their boat and drowned them all for good, Isabel would have prayed for rain to break, break the muggy heat. Isabel's father had rigged up a makeshift sunshade out of his shirt for her mother, and she seemed better now. The aspirin had kept mommy's fever down, and though she was still exhausted and near to bursting with Isabel's baby brother, she seemed at peace somehow. Hot, but at peace. If the rest of them wanted relief, they had to wait their turn in the water. Again, Isabel thought about their journey as a song. If the riots and trading for the gasoline were the first verse, and the tanker and the storm the second verse, this part of their trip, the long, hot, stagnant day and a half they had been traveling from the Bahamas to Florida, this was the bridge. A third verse that was different from the others. This verse was death by slow measures. This was the down-tempo lull before the coming excitement of the climactic last verse and coda this was limbo they could do nothing but wait the last sliver of sun finally disappeared below the waves and lewis cut the engine the world went silent but for the lapping soft lapping of water against the hull and the creak of their disintegrating boat that's it lewis said with the sun down we won't be able to navigate as well can't we use the stars isabel asked she remembered reading that sailors had used the stars to navigate for centuries. Which one? Lewis asked. None of them knew. Amara lifted one of the gasoline jugs and swished around what little there was left in it. 
Save us gas, anyway, she said. The thing's been eating it up. We'll be lucky to have enough to get to shore when we see land. When will we get there? Ivan asked. He was bobbing in the water just ahead of Isabel, hanging onto the hull like she was. Tomorrow, hopefully, Signor Castillo said from inside the boat. It was the same thing he'd said yesterday and the day before. Mañana, Isabel's grandfather whispered. He was treading water on the other side of the boat with Senora Castillo, his head just visible over the side. He'd been whispering that word off, off on and on since yesterday and still seemed shaken up somehow. Isabel didn't know why. We'll see the lights of Miami sometime tomorrow and we'll head straight for it, Mommy said. She shifted and winced uncomfortably. What is it? Are you all right? Poppy asked. Isabel's mother put a hand on her belly. I think it's begun. What's begun? Poppy asked. Then his eyes went wide. You mean, you mean the baby's coming? Here? Now? Everyone in the boat perked up and Isabel and Ivan pulled themselves up on the side of the boat to see. Isabel was a jumble of emotions. She was excited to see her brother born after waiting so long, but suddenly she was also afraid. Afraid for her mother to have the baby here on this fragile raft in the middle of the ocean. And worry too, for the first time, about how her baby brother would change her fragile family. Yes, I think I've gone into labor, Isabel's mother said calmly. But no, I am not having the baby here and now. The contractions are just starting. It took Isabel's mother another 10 hours. It took Isabel another 10 hours to come after my contractions began. Remember? Isabel had never heard her mother talk about her birth before, and she was both curious and a little weirded out at the same time. What are you going to name him? Ivan asked. Mommy and Poppy looked at each other. We haven't decided yet, she said. Well, I have some good ideas if you want some, Ivan said. We're not naming him after industrialist players, Isabel told him, and Ivan stuck his tongue out at her. They were all quiet for, for a time, and Isabel watched as the golden horizon shifted from orange to purple to deep blue. Would her baby brother be born at sea or in the United States? Would the end of their song really be a new life in Miami? Or would it end in tragedy for all of them, adrift, out of gas, and dying of thirst in the great saltwater desert of the Atlantic? Hey, we never named our boat, Ivan said. Everyone moaned and laughed. What? Ivan said, smiling. Every good boat needs a name. I think we all agree this isn't a good boat, Senor Castillo said. But it's the boat that's taking us to the States, to freedom, Ivan said. It deserves a name. How about Fidel? Lewis joked, kick, kicking up a splash on Castro's face at the bottom of the boat. No, 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 Poppy said. El Aduadad Flotante, the floating coffin. Isabel winced at the name. It wasn't funny. Not with her mother about to have a baby on the boat. Too close, too close, Senor Castillo agreed. How about me piro, he suggested. It was slang for I'm out of here in Cuba. Chao Pascal, Mommy said, and everyone laughed. It liter literally meant goodbye, fish, but everyone in Cuba said it to each other to say goodbye. The St. Louis, Isabel's grandfather said softly. Everyone was quiet for a moment, trying to figure out the joke, but no one understood. How about El Camelo, Lewis said, the camel. Was that what they called the ugly humpback buses pulled around by tractors in Havana? No, no, I've got it, Amara cried. El Botero, it was perfect because it was the slang word for the taxis in Havana, but it actually meant the boatman. All the adults laughed and clapped. No, no, Ivan said, frustrated. It needs a cool sounding name. The, Ivan jumped a little in the water and his eyes went wide. The what, Isabel asked. Then she jumped too. Something hard and leathery bumped into her leg. Shark! screamed Isabel's grandfather from the other side of the boat. Shark! The water around Ivan became a dark red cloud and Isabel screamed. Something bu bumped into her again and Isabel scrambled to climb into the boat, arms and legs shaking, panic thundering in her chest. Her father grabbed her around the middle and they fell back tumble inside the boat. Beside them, Amara and Mommy helped pull Senor Castillo into the boat as Lito pushed her up out of the water from behind. Isabel and her father scrambled to their knees and pulled her grandfather in behind her. On the other side of the boat, Louis and Senor Castillo cried out Ivan's name as they hauled his limp body over the side. 
Ivan's right leg was a bloody mess. There were small bites all over it, as though a gang of sharks had attacked all at once. Raw, red, gaping wounds exposed the muscle underneath his skin. Isabel fell back against the side of the boat in horror. She'd never seen anything so awful. She felt like she was going to throw up. Senora Castillo wailed. Ivan was so shocked he didn't even cry out, didn't speak. His eyes had a glazed look to them and his mouth hung open. One of the gashes up near his thigh was pumping blood out like a garden hose. And Isabel watched as Ivan's face grew pale. She couldn't speak. A tourniquet, Lito cried. We have to get something around his leg to stop the bleeding. Isabel's father yanked off his belt and Lito tied it as high around Ivan's leg as he could. But the blood still flowed, coloring the water all around them in the boat, dark, sickening red. No, no, Signor Castillo cried as the life went out of Ivan's eyes. Isabel wanted to scream too, but she was frozen. There was nothing she could do. There was nothing any of them could do. Ivan was dead. Lewis yelled in rage and pulled his police pistol from his holster. Bang, 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 he fired once, twice, three times at the fin that circled the boat. No, Lito said, grabbing Lewis's hand before he could shoot again. You'll just bring more short sharks with the blood in the water. Too late, another fin appeared and another. And soon, the nameless little boat was surrounded. They were trapped in their own sinking prison. Mahmoud, Lesbos, Greece, to Athens, Greece, the year 2015, 12 days from home. Mahmoud was in another tent city. The paved parking lot at the pier in Lesbos was full of the kinds of camping tents sold in sporting goods stores. Round top single family tents of blue and green and white and yellow and red, all provided by Greek relief workers who knew the refugees had nowhere to stay while they waited for the ferry to Athens to come. Wet clothes were hung out to dry on bicycle racks and traffic signs, and refugees gathered around camp stoves and hot plates. It should have been a lively place, full of songs and laughter like the Killis refugee camp, but instead a soft, mournful murmur of conversation hung over the tent city like a fog. Mahmoud wasn't surprised. His family felt exactly the same way. They all should have been excited to finally be in Greece to be allowed to buy real tickets to travel on an actual ferry to mainland Europe. But too many of them had lost someone in the sea crossing to be happy. Mahmoud's mother had gone from tent to tent asking after Hannah. Mahmoud had helped. It was his fault she was gone after all. But no one in the dock had her, and no one had been on the dinghy that had taken her. Refugees came and went, but the tents remained, and Mahmoud's mother insisted they miss the next ferry to Athens, so she could ask new round of refugees for word of her daughter, but no one knew anything about her. Mahmoud felt as sick as he had on the dinghy. He couldn't look at his mother. She had to blame him for losing Hannah. He certainly blamed himself. He couldn't sleep at night. He kept picturing his sister's dinghy bursting on the rocks, Hannah falling into the water, none of them there to help her. Mahmoud's mother wanted to stay at the dock longer, didn't want to leave without knowing what happened to Hannah, but dad told her they had to move on. There was no telling when the ferry line might suddenly decide to stop selling tickets to refugees or when Greece might decide to send them all home. They had to keep moving or they would die. Hannah had to have gone ahead of them on the morning ferry they'd missed that first day or else. No one wanted to think about the or else. The huge Athens ferry arrived again that morning. It was the length of a soccer field and at least five stories tall. The bottom half of it was painted blue, and the blue star fairies was written in big words on the side. A radar bar spun near the bridge, and antennas and satellite dishes sprouted from the roof. It looked like the pictures Mahmoud had seen of the cruise ships. Its lifeboats alone were bigger than the dinghy they had left Turkey in. Mahmoud tried to get Walid interested in the big ship, to get him excited about their first trip on a boat that big. But his little brother didn't care. He didn't seem to care about anything. A big ramp on the back lowered and refugees streamed on board the ferry. Mahmoud's mother wept as they climbed a ramp with the other passengers. She kept looking back over her shoulder at the tent city, hoping, Mahmoud was sure, to catch a glimpse of someone carrying a baby who might be Hannah. But she never did. Inside of the ferry was like the lobby of a fancy hotel. Every floor had a little cluster of glass tables and white upholstered chairs. 
snack bars sold chips and sweets and sodas, and television played a Greek soccer game. Refugees who still had belongings stuffed their backpacks and trash bags under tables and into the overhead compartments. Mahmoud and his family settled into one of the booths, and his father searched for a plug to charge his phone. Mahmoud, why don't you take your brother to explore the ship? Dad told him. Mahmoud was only too glad to get away from the sight of his mother's broken face, and he told Walid by the ha- pulled Walid by the hand and pulled him out onto the promenade that ran around the outside of the ship. Mahmoud and Walid watched silently as the ferry pulled away from the dock and the ship's huge engines thrumming deep below them. The awful sea that had tried to swallow them was calm and sapphire blue now. The Greek island of Lesbos was actually beautiful when you saw it from the sea. Little white buildings with terracotta roofs rose up tree-covered hills, and on top of one of the hills was an ancient gray castle. Mahmoud could see why people visited there on vacation. Besides the refugees, there was a number of tourists on board. Mahmoud could tell they weren't refugees because they wore clean clothes and used their phones for taking pictures instead of looking up overland routes from Athens to Macedonia. Another refugee had laid out a mat on the deck, and he was praying. In all the bustle of waiting in line and getting on board, Mahmoud had lost track of what time it was, and he pulled his brother down with him to pray alongside the man. As he kneeled and stood, kneeled and stood, Mahmoud was supposed to be focused only on his prayers, but he couldn't help but notice the uneasy looks the tourists were giving them, the frowns of displeasure, like Mahmoud and his brother and this man were doing something wrong. The vacationers dropped their voices, and even though Mahmoud couldn't understand what they were saying, he could hear their disgust in their words. This wasn't what the tourists had paid for. They were supposed to be on holiday, seeing ancient ruins and beautiful Greek beaches, not stepping over filthy praying refugees. They only see us when we do something they don't want us to do, Mahmoud realized. The thought hit him like a lightning bolt. When they stay where they... When they stayed where they were supposed to be, in the ruins of Aleppo or behind the fences of a refugee camp, people could forget about them. But when refugees did something they didn't want them to do, when they tried to cross the border into their country or slept on the front stoops of their shops or jumped in front of their cars or prayed on the decks of their ferries, that's when people couldn't ignore them any longer. Mahmoud's first instinct was to disappear below the decks, to be invisible, Being invisible in Syria had kept him alive, but now Mahmoud began to wonder if being invisible in Europe might be the death of him and his family. If no one saw them, no one could help them, and maybe the world needed to see what was really happening here. It was hard to see the refugees in Athens when Mahmoud got there. Syrians were everywhere, in the streets, in hotels, in markets, most of them, like Mahmoud's family, planning to move on as soon as they could. Mahmoud's father thought he had the right documents to travel freely in Greece, but a woman at the immigration office told him he would need to go to the local police station first to get an official document, and the police told him he would have to wait up to a week. We can't wait a week, Mahmoud's father told his family. They had found a hotel for 10 euros a night per person, and the people of Athens were very friendly and helpful, but Mahmoud knew his parents only had so much money and they still had four more countries to cross before they reached Germany. Mahmoud's mother would have stayed a week or even longer to keep asking everyone she met if they had seen a baby named Hannah, but it was decided they would take a train to the border of Macedonia and try to sneak across during the night.